This is the story of two rabbits. Two rabbits that hopped out of a children's picture book and into the hot, bright light of the real world. A world so unbelievable, you could only call it the Deep South. Well, let's call it the Deep South of the imagination. It was a land where the soil was rich and black and the air was always thick. Now your name and position for the gentleman of the committee. I am Emily Wheelock Reed. I am director of the Alabama Public Library Service. And what does being director of the library service entail? I and my staff seek to provide guidance, resources, and of course books to libraries throughout the state. Librarians come to Montgomery to our office in the glorious archive building to view new books in the stacks or use our research materials. We also distribute the recommended book list that is provided by ALA, the American Library Association. The American Library Association, where are they based? In Chicago. And you distribute around the state of Alabama what this association recommends. Their biannual notable books list. Yes. May I get a copy of the latest notable books list that you have spread like dandelion seeds throughout Alabama? Well, of course, we will get that to you. And these notable books are in the Alabama Public Library Services holdings. Yes, or they are probably on order. <laughs> so going back for our newcomers, <clears throat> you are then sort of the head librarian in Alabama. That is one way to put it, yes. Don't be shy, Miss Reed. You are really the state librarian. Well. <laughs> you are. You are, and I think it's something to be proud of, chief librarian of the great state of Alabama. Now, tell me, Miss Reed, if I was a little librarian from, say, Tom Big County, and I wanted new books for my little library, could I come to you for advice? Yes. That is exactly what you might do. And you might recommend books. Yes, based on the needs of your community, yes. What was that? Well, say that for me once more, Miss Reed. I'm a little deaf in his ear here from a hunting trip I took as a boy, a ringing. I often hear a dull ringing in his ear here. I might recommend books, keeping in mind the needs of the community. The needs of the community. By that you mean what? You wouldn't want to recommend to the Tom Bibbitt County Public Library a book about, say, how to build an igloo. Well, that would depend. On what, Miss Reed? On the county's interest in igloos, sir. But Tom Bibbitt County hasn't seen snow ever as far as any modern history is concerned, Miss Reed. But still, the community might be curious about igloo, Senator. They may, in fact, dream at night about the mysteries of igloos. Books allow us to solve mysteries, satisfy curiosity, realize dreams. <laughs> I don't know about dreams, Miss Reed, but why recommend such a book? Tell me, honestly now, do you think the ladies of the Tom Big County chapter of the Women's Christian Temperance Union are likely to move their Thursday meetings into an igloo? I don't. <laughs> No, sir, I don't. <laughs> I agree with you on that point, but that does not preclude the county's interest in other cultures. And if the Tom Bigby County librarian sought such a book for her constituency, I would do what I could to get her that book, a book funded by your good committee. Oh, there's that ringing in my ear again, Miss Reed. Could you back up for me? Say again what you said before. I would help a librarian find a book. No, earlier. If the library's constituency- Before that. I suggested that the community might be interested in other cultures, Senator. Other cultures? Other cultures? What does that mean? A culture other than your own, Senator? A culture other than my own? Are we talking about Eskimos, Miss Reed, or something else? We are talking about any culture you wish to know about, including the Eskimo or Inuit people, as they are sometimes called. Other than my own. Though. Yes, and including your own culture. 
So there is room for my culture in the Tom Bigby County Library. <laughs> there has always been a place for you at the Tom Bigby County Library, Senator. Your culture has been well represented since the very founding of the library and the establishment of that county. You are so well represented, in fact, that the culture for which the county is named has been blotted out by volumes of books concentrating on your culture. My culture. I'm sure you know what Tom Bigby means. I admit I don't. Tom Bigby is a Choctaw Indian word, roughly meaning coffin maker. Hmm. It refers to burial boxes used by Choctaws. I uh, see. Well, for the record, Miss Reed, I hail from Marengo County, named for an Italian town. Now, back to the budget, sir. Where are you from, Miss Reed? From? I live in Montgomery, sir. But where are your people from? I was born in Asheville. Asheville, Alabama? No, North Carolina. Oh, I assumed you were an Alabama lady. I am now. But not born here. keep you but a minute, Joshua. I, I have something of yours. You said you were coming back 4th of July, so I, I thought I'd drop by. I knew you'd be worshiping here at Martin Luther's church. Martin Luther King Jr.'s church. Yes, King. I asked at the hotel front desk if they could tell me where Mr. King's church was, but... It's Dr. King. Yes where his church was located, but no one at the front desk knew. So uh, I asked the bellman because I thought he might know. And he gave me the funniest up and down look. He pointed me this way. You walked all the way here from the Jeff Davis. Where's your driver? I, I told him I was going for a walk. He doesn't need to know my business. I had to see you. To, to give you this. You, you left it behind at Oak Park. And I, I wanted to return it here that very day, but I didn't have the courage. You said you'd be back in a few weeks, so here we are. You said it was your mama's. Thank you. You can't worship without a Bible close at hand. Worship, Lily. You didn't hear a word I said, did you? No, no, I, I heard every syllable. Unforgettable what you said about our Demopolis days. Lily, I don't worship here. I volunteer here. Look, when's the last time you saw a Negro in your section of the movie theater? Is there a Negro at your favorite cafeteria who isn't your serving you? Have you shared a table at a library with a Negro? I'm here for integration, doing what I can to prove Alabama for my people, my people in this world, not the next. But you carry your Bible with you. Yes, as I show respect for these people who took in my mother, it only means something to me and that my mama's name is in it. The rest of it holds no value. I'm sure you don't mean that. Me and God? We haven't been on speaking terms since the day I left Demopolis. You understand we were cast out? Mama couldn't find work in all of Marengo County because of what happened. People talked. So we came to Montgomery. We scraped along. Mama breaking her back. Working here at the church part-time, cleaning as we squeeze through life, 
God gradually got squeezed out of me. She could believe in him. They can believe in him. You can believe in him. But a God that steps aside and allows men to be cruel to men, that's not something for me to worship. But Mama made you a cake. What? A, a cake. Mama baked a lane cake for you and your mama. She had it sent over to where, wherever you went after you left us. That was kindness, not cruelty. Wasn't there a cake? Do you remember a cake? Yeah, I, I remember that cake. A car pulled up at Lone Baptist after we left you. That was Mr. Foley, the caretaker at Trinity who drove the cake over. Wow, you remember everything, don't you? It was a beautiful cake. Yeah, I remember thinking, I wanted a cake. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> when Mama saw it and knew it was from the big house, she took that cake. She walked it across the church property into the woods. She threw that cake, plate and all, against a tree. We were broken into thick pieces and scattered everywhere. She marched back into that church and prayed. She got closer and closer to God over the years. Find a place here at Dexter Avenue Baptist. And I was a boy in the pew, in the church. I was looking out the window. Wanting, I don't know. Cake, I guess. I just thought your Bible might be important to you. Uh, it is, you're right. Mama's name is in it. It was her mama's before her when she was dying over at a Hale hospital. She pressed into my hand and said, don't forget about old Alabama. And her face brightened and she said, soon I will be done with the troubles of the world. I'm going to live with I'm God. I'm going to live with God. There were nights I would sneak across the lawn and listen outside your breezeway and hear her sing those very words. I could have returned your Bible to the church secretary here weeks ago, I know. But I liked having something of yours for this little while. I need to get back to the Jeff Davis. Uh, yo, Daddy, uh, how's he doing? No improvement. I should just become a resident of Montgomery. I'm here often enough. But if I'm not here for him, who will be? Most of his friends are gone now. We go to great lengths for our parents. <laughs> we do indeed. H how, how long are you here for? I'll drive back to Detroit tomorrow after the church's Independence Day picnic. I'll be here again in November. I don't think I'll be here at the Jeff Davis, but who knows? Thank you for the book. The Bible. Of course. I wish I could say what you want me to say. But you want me to remember. You can't do what you can't do. Go on inside and do your work. Can you talk for a moment? Yes. A couple of things. Uh, 
the Associated Press is now going through me to try to get to you. They still want to talk to you. Tell them no. I am glad you came by. Would you close the door, please? I have been wondering, how is it, do you think, that the Montgomery Home News originally got wind of the acquisition of the rabbit's wedding? Oh, well, that's a good question. Yes. Children's literature would not seem to be foremost in the minds of editors there, yet they had intimate knowledge of our holdings. Jane has no record of a special request from the local media. Well, countless people have access to information about our holdings, librarians from around the state, the public at large. And you. Well, sure, and me, and you, and Jane, and the library board, the staff. I, I found it odd that when the story broke in the home news, you had such awareness, such memory of the title being part of our collection. And you also told me that your family subscribes to the, to the Montgomery, Montgomery Home, Home News. News. I see. And the morning after the story appeared, you were unusually late for work. You seemed preoccupied. I would say suspicious when you came to me with the headline. I was late that morning, if you must know, because I'm the sole caregiver of my infirm widow or father whose ailments are multiple. That morning he soiled himself and I had to tend to it. Do you require more explanation than that? I'm a private person, Miss Reed. I'm a bookish, peculiar 28 year old man who still lives with his father out of obligation or maybe out of fear that if I leave that house, I'll have to face myself and my place in the world. Do you really think I tipped off the home news? Do you think that I scrawl in a childlike hand words that are odious and ugly to me? Do you know who Juliet Hampton Morgan is? Thomas, I- Juliet Hampton Morgan, was a refined and intelligent Southern lady who worked as a reference librarian at the city library here in Montgomery, not long ago. Like very few white folks in town, she was troubled by the treatment of Negroes on Montgomery buses. So during the time of Rosa Parks and the boycott, she wrote a letter to the editor that appeared in the Montgomery Advertiser, right there in the tell it to old grandma column for all to see with her name signed to it praising the efforts of Dr. King and his Montgomery Improvement Association and those who chose taxis and carpools and shoe leather over the bus system. And oh, what a little black ink in a Montgomery newspaper, any Montgomery newspaper can do to stain a person. She was sneered at at work she was spat at at the bus stop. She was clucked at at church, at the drugstore, at the butcher while crossing the street, waiting in line for a movie. Wherever she might have been, the good white men and women of Montgomery called her all matter of names. And they didn't just throw epithets. They threw bricks. Good Southern bricks from good Southern Claire right clear through the windows of the house that she shared with her mother. One night she pulled back the lace curtain to find a cross blazing orange on their front lawn. The next day, Miss Juliet Hampton Morgan abruptly quit the city library. The push of the world was taking its toll on her. Her high blood pressure was higher than usual. That night, at bedtime, the thin-skinned, deep-thinking Miss Morgan took her prescription pills, perhaps one or two extra for reinforcement, switched off the lamp, and never woke to see another morning in Montgomery. I know this story by heart because my first job after college 
was at the city library where I was assistant to Miss Juliet Hampton Morgan. I was her witness, Miss Reed, unable to guide her or protect her or save her. Her story is my story too, Miss Reed. But even without me telling it, you should have thought better of me. Thomas. When you put that children's book on the reserve shelf, it reminded me of her. And it clarified for me what it is we do here. You protect the books, Miss Reed. And I protect you. Here now, Thomas. Take my hand and know that I am sorry. Please, I was wrong. I regret the accusation. No, no, you don't have to. I, I do. I was wrong and I am sorry. Look at me, please. These events, this mess, I took it out on you. I am so deeply sorry. I will not make this mistake again. I. I hope you will forgive me. Of course I forgive you, Miss Reed. And, and I apologize if I came off too strong. Stop. I... You have nothing to apologize for. You were perfect. Perfect. The apology is owed to you. Now, let us move beyond this back to work and back to who we are. We have work to do. Everybody, if you want to unmute yourselves for a second, so you can- Hey. Hey, everybody. Good job, everybody. <laughs> oh, what a treat to experience just a piece of that play again. And Jeremy, thanks for making me cry. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my you know, God. Good job. <laughs> oh, that was, that was beautiful. Thank you all. Wonderful. What a, what, a, what a treat to experience part of this play again. Uh, I want to say take a bow, but I guess that's sort of silly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> We have the playwright Kenneth Jones here. We're going to talk to him for a few minutes, then we're going to open things up for a Q&A. You are all welcome to type questions into the chat or raise your hand through the Zoom button or in general. Uh, either way, it's all good. But first, Ken, we're so glad you're here. Tell us a few words about this play and how I, Emily was a real person. I, I first came across this story when I was reading the New York Times, <clears throat> and I stumbled upon Emily Reed's obituary. And um, as I've said before, uh, the minute I read it, it was a play. I thought it would, this is the material for a play. It had obvious um, good guys and bad guys, black and white, north and south, male and female, insider and outsider. Um, I just saw it as a play. And because there was a children's story element to it, it's about a children's book, right? It's about a black rabbit that marries a white rabbit and how this book was censored in the deep South in the fifties. I, I knew I wanted to have the author of the book uh, represented in a character. And I wanted, you know, I steal from a lot of really good sources. So I wanted the, the narrator, I wanted Garth Williams to be the narrator. I wanted him to be like the stage manager in our town. You know, there's a lot of presentation in this and performance in it. And Steve did it so beautifully, you know, putting on many, many hats and just weaving in and out of scenes. Um, you know, I, and I wanted it to be a romance. So there's Lily and Joshua become sort of the perfume of the play and the human side, the intimate side of these larger issues in the play. Uh, but I also wanted it to be a courtroom thriller and a workplace drama and all the kinds of plays that we really grew up watching or the kind of stuff that's really meaty and uh, I wouldn't say full of cliches, but it's, it's the, there, these are forms that are well known. I wanted to blend them and mash them up and jam them together and create something that was hyper theatrical 
and couldn't necessarily be reproduced on film. I wanted to be really of the stage. I think one of the things I, that, that I so appreciated about Lisa Millet's production is um, I, I found out that the play could work on an intimate level, on a unit set. I had seen uh, uh, one or two other productions that were things moved in and moved out, but it kind of wants to live in this realm that is theatrical and it's one spot. And um, it's what I really sort of dug is that it, it can play intimately and it can play uh, big, you know, it, 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 I think the City Lights is 100 seats, is that right? Yeah, I mean, it's, that's my dream. It's how I, I went to the theater. I grew up in, in Detroit where, we, where I went to 100 seat theaters all the time, 200 seat theaters and Intimate is my favorite kind of theater experience. I don't wanna be in a 5,000 seat house. It's fun, but it's good for concerts. And the play was originally published in 2015, is that right? Or well, it was, yeah, yeah, it was first produced in, in 2015. It has not yet been published. And as I mentioned to you earlier, it's one of the great things. I mean, I always thought success meant being published. It's, it's since, since it's been at City Lights, it's had about 35 other productions around the country. And I've been so lucky to, to be able to see, um, I've seen eight or nine productions and I've learned from each production, including City Lights production, where it's like, uh, Lisa really kicked a lot of sand over this because I, I trimmed it up, I cleaned it up. There's more momentum to it now. I mean, you guys did it so beautifully and found the, you know, the tiny details and the broad strokes in it, all of you were so just breathtaking. It was one, it's absolutely one of my favorite productions, but I continued to learn. I took notes and, and um, it's just a better piece of, of writing now. And I'm really pleased to say that it had its Montgomery premiere uh, this past March at Alabama Shakespeare Festival where it's set, you know, and it was thrilling to be there. Unfortunately, it was the week that COVID hit. So it was a three week, three week run. It was cut short by one week. March 15th is the weekend we all remember everything got shut down. And that was our the end of our second week. I got to meet some local dignitaries and I got to meet a guy who knew Senator Higgins. Um, he knew he went to bar he was in barber shops in Demopolis with Senator Higgins. Um, and he said that I made Senator Higgins uh, much more likable than he was in real life. Apparently he was a very cruel uh, unkind person who who was um, yeah it was hard to to talk to this guy and this guy did not like Senator Higgins and was very free to talk to me about it um, it's, it's very powerful to to be able to go to productions and do talkbacks where people want to talk to you afterwards and it's it's uh, black folks and white folks and young people and old people and and there was this big burly white guy who came up to me and I was a little afraid of him. I didn't know what his response would be. And he said, I grew up in a racist household and he had tears flowing down his face. I grew up in a racist household. And I said, we're, you know, we're part of this system. We're all part of this system. And I said, I, I hear you. And he just, he couldn't talk to me anymore, but he was so grateful to hear this play. And I think it's important for everyone to see this play, if I may say so, but I think it's particularly important to see people talking one-on-one, -on -one, characters who talk one-on-one -on -one and face each other and don't necessarily shame each other, but really try to have a conversation because I think our existing you know, organizations and systems and government is, is failing us in a lot of ways. So I think the one-on-one -on -one is really powerful. And I heard that tonight and, and um, I, I just, I carry all of your talent with me. Um, I just, and you know, I really want to work at City Lights again. So I would love to come back. It was a great experience being in San Jose. And thank you for inviting me, um, not just tonight, but, but, but you know, in 2018, um, that was really magical to, to have a residency there. And, and, and um, it meant the world to me. It was a treat for us to have you here in our production. Uh, Cass, remind me, Ken, were you at rehearsals? How did you, what was the residency like? Lisa, what, what did we do? I came a couple weeks, I came in preview, uh, yeah. tech, tech, tech week. Right, you, um, you gave me a chance to get something up and going for you to look at. Yeah. And uh, I also appreciated that you were 100% accessible during the rehearsal process. 
over the phone and emails and um uh and then you came out to help us you know look at what we had what we had done together and um help put some finishing touches on um i love that you said i kicked up sand that I've never heard that expression about me before, but I tend to do that. And I remember I kicked up a lot of sand about um, something at the end where in the script, you wanted us to go back into her office. Do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. That change, we were supposed to go back into her office and I pushed back on that. I was like, oh, we're so close to the end. If we have a giant set change right now, I just feel like people yeah. might. And uh, you gave, um, I feel like you gave me a chance to try to tell that part of the story um, without a set change. And did we fix it? Is, was that where she was saying yeah. goodbye? To, yeah. is, it, is it where she was saying goodbye to? Yeah. And as I was telling the cast in the pre-show, just in the green room, um, I've since rewritten that. So now the good, two goodbye scenes are blended and they take place in, it's a Lisa Millette note, right? I mean, uh, I, I, so seriously, I did blend those and it's just such a better play now. And that's what you learn as you as you go away. And I said, kick sand over, not kick up sand. Oh, so you, okay. you kick some sand over. <laughs> I heard kick up but no, that, that, that sounds aggressive no you kick some sand over my rough patches you know seriously so I, it's all I was so I was so um grateful though that you were open to why don't we try this so that we don't have to stop the momentum of the emotion and the engagement and I felt like it it worked really I felt like it worked really well and I'm glad that you you took it there afterwards yeah yeah, and I also, you know, what some of the viewers may or may not know is that this was a licensed production. It's very rare for a playwright to come in after a world premiere or after an a show has been established. And so I was really grateful to come in and that, you know, it's scary having a playwright come in. It's like, you know, there I am sitting there waiting. But, it, you know, I really always take it as a learning experience and as a potential future collaboration. I mean, just the way we're talking about this and the way we talk about it, it's like one day we will work on something brand new together in a room. Um, and I was so grateful that you invited me into to the process. Well, that was the best. That was the best that it worked out that you could come out and it meant so much to the cast and uh, to the company and to me. And, you know, we, we all established very true, real relationships. I know that at least Karen and I both have visited you in New York since, yeah. and like, and it's Anne. All, it's all, and Anne, yes, it's all about relationship building, and yeah. um, I can't wait for the next time, seriously. Yeah, I loved my time in San Jose, I loved going to coffee houses and doing some writing, it was a great writing week for me too, I, you know, when you guys were working or when there was downtime, I would go to all these great coffee houses and cafes and just write, and it was kind of, you know, I used it as a little writing retreat, it was great, and wonderful hosts, and Jim Lewis took us out to dinner, and you know, just great, you grow great people there, and I'm really excited to follow your progress as you continue to, you know, aim toward a new home. Right, there's that. <laughs> New home, still yes. out there, looming. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I have a, one thing that I learned doing this show, and I didn't know, I knew that Emily was such you know, a great hero, but I had a gentleman, Walter Mays, come up to me after the play and he said, you don't understand that this woman is a cult hero among librarians all over the country. And I had no idea, but evidently that's the case. And Ken, I'm wondering if you've had that feedback at these other productions where other librarians have shown up and 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 you, you got that same feeling that this is something that's not a small contained experience that it's known out there in the professional uh, well, librarians like crazy. Yeah, I think some people know her um, she is a cult hero in that she's not really that known. What what is mostly known is that librarians are still facing these problems today. Today they are persecuted. The materials are much different. It's LGBTQ plus materials. It's materials that have to do with the occult and wizardry and witchcraft. Sorry, Harry Potter, but you're on the shit list. Oh, can I say shit? Um, it's it's off off it's off Broadway. We can say shit. Um, you know, so it's 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 the same 
everything old is new again. Um, so yeah, yeah. But Emily is a hero. She said she wasn't a hero. She wasn't trying to be a crusader. She says it in the play, but um, in fact, she is very mu was very much ahead of her time and was later recognized, of course, by the American Library Association and by the Freedom to Read Foundation, of which I'm a member. I'd love to hear from Karen about her playing this role. Karen, you played this real life hero. Tell us a little bit about the experience. I fell in love with Emily Wheelock Reed and I read everything I could on her. And um, uh, I felt very gratified to be able to represent her. Um, it's not often there are plays where um, a little old lady uh, is the central piece of the play and is the uh, the heroine. So it was uh, awesome to be able to do that. It was also really fun to be doing that up against big Eric Gandolfi in the courtroom scenes because I'm 5'1 and Eric is taller than that. <laughs> substantially so it was really fun to be able to do that uh um scene with that uh, juxtaposition and again um she wasn't intimidated yeah so no i i loved uh playing her and would love to again especially <clears throat> with the new script and everything so. but uh <laughs> i do have to say i um I worked on that script when uh, when I knew Ken was going to be there. I wanted everything word perfect, and so I'd work on it at home. And I said, Ken, if there's anything, if I if I do, I say A, and it should be Anne. I want it every single. I want it perfect because he'll know. Um, and then one night, Jeremy, I don't know if you remember, I went up. I couldn't remember resignation. I said, I submitted my letter of, of my letter of. I couldn't remember that word. And I just looked at Jeremy and I went, what is it? And he went, resignation. And I went, that's it. I, I didn't even want to say it. Oh my God. And I, I came up to Ken afterwards and I'm so sorry. But I guess I got, got myself worked up a little bit because I wanted it so perfect. So anyway, but it was, a, it was a pleasure. It was a gift and thanks Ken. And thanks Lisa for casting me. You know, uh, if I may just take a second to say that I have directed a whole slew of plays. I'm not even sure how many. Um, and sometimes it comes together in, in a way that is truly beautiful. And I think that starts with the script, Kenneth Jones. I think that it starts with the story you're telling. And then I think it goes to the organization putting the right people in the room at the right time. I think that Yvette Del Toro and her casting and, um, uh, and me not so much for the directing but knowing the right human souls that should be on working on the project, the human beings, not what I ask them to do but just who you bring into the room. And honestly, it does not often happen that an experience from beginning to end is 100% lovely. And this was one of those plays. This was one of those shows. This was one of those stories where I am not kidding, like everything about it was lovely. And rehearsals were beautiful. The cast was amazing. There is, there is, I, I mean, I also just want to super compliment Austin, who I, uh, whom I don't know, but you did great tonight, and I can't wait to get to know you better. Um, seriously, it's so nice to meet you, and thank you for stepping in like that. Um, but this, the the room was always filled with so much um, love, and also risk taking, and bravery, and and courage. And um, I think everybody understood what you were saying, Ken, everybody in that room from the first day understood the importance of this story, that it is so beyond our bubble 
City Lights Theater Company, San Jose, like the story itself is so much bigger and so much more important than than any any than any of those small um, lenses that you could use. And I think everybody really got that from the beginning. And um, I, I have rarely had a full experience like from reading the play by myself in my home and going, oh, this is pretty good. <laughs> All the way to opening night with, you know, so thankful to have you with us where every bit of it was um, really beautiful and, and filled with so much uh, love and, um, and hard work and compassion and the understanding that this isn't just a play. You know, it's not just a play. And I think we all felt that. And I thank you for that, Ken, because you wrote those words. You gave us that gift. Thank you so much. I, I um, thank you again for doing it. It's it all goes back to Emily Reed and uh, the quality of her character, right? And I don't mean character theater. I mean character. This is a play about character and how people treat each other and how people behave. And you know that that final scene where Emily says goodbye to the senator still breaks my heart with what Karen and Eric did. It is a gut buster, not because of the writing, but also what you brought to it. Um, so thank you for that and thanks for the compliments. It's so true though. And being so lucky to have Steve back and you know, I, I, I super, super love working with Jeremy <laughs> and Maria and Eric and Karen. Like it was, it was a dream. It was a, it was a dream show for me. I'd love to hear Eric talk about the experience of playing well not such a nice guy and also not such a nice guy and the challenge of playing someone who was real was there reason yeah. involved in the character uh for you tell us about it well um i can you actually did change his last name correct the senator and, yes. and i that was one of the first questions i'd asked like well there's okay this this antagonist who was a big deal against emily you know i was curious why did you change that? And I, what you told me that you you talked to someone from the family, they weren't comfortable. What what was what was well, the deal I, behind that? I, it was less that I talked to someone and more that I didn't have a record of whether he really did have a change of heart. And I, you know, he says some pretty ugly things in this play. Yeah. What he yeah. says is an imagined conversation because it was a hearing that doesn't have any public record. And I wanted to, right. and he had living relatives. I think that's why I did it. Okay. As, as it turns out, he apparently was, you know, it was, yeah, it was it worse. Was, I mean, that, that, that didn't, you know, change the shape of the character. I mean, it, I played it as written and the guy is an SOB. I mean, he is someone that just represents that era full on, you know, and I play a lot of heavies, obviously, villainous types, dastardly people. And I always try to find something in there that makes him likable or human and can provide that opportunity. You know, we find out a little bit about the character when um, Jeremy's character says, well, he has an affinity for Tom Sawyer. And I have this wonderful little, uh, Higgins has this wonderful little speech about his affection for Tom Sawyer and how it touched him as a child and how he lost that book in a huge flood and how it, you know, kind of broke his heart. And you see that everyone in this play, even Higgins has a love or an affinity for books or in his case, a particular book, you know, so the entire play is about books and that grounded me into the community. You know, I got a chance to show that, you know, even though he's a, you know what, you know, I could kind of almost relate to this guy. But when you have to put the pedal down, like in the courtroom scenes, that's when I think the viciousness of this character really shines out. And like Karen said, to have her, I mean, I'm 6'4", she's 5'1". Yeah, we're like, you know, a, a George and Lenny out there, okay? And to have her just look up at me, defiant, stoic look, and just like, how am I going to get this woman to break? You know, I mean, I can't punch her. You know, I can't, I can't arrest her. I can't, I got outsmart her and I can't, I can't, you know. But what's beautiful is that there is a turning point at the end. So the character's arc 
was well met at the end when she actually gives him an original copy of the Tom Sawyer book that he had lost as a child. So it gives that little whisper of hope that, you know, maybe we can get it together and stop being the way we've been, a la Higgins. Plus, it's fun to play the bad guy. Come on. <laughs> yeah, I just noted in the chat, you've played the Lord of the Underworld. So it's like, you don't yeah. play the bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's typecasting, what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask Austin what it was like stepping in tonight. And this was, did you know the play before or were you introduced to it? <clears throat> uh, you know, it. I hadn't heard of this play before, but um, I actually was a little tempted because I have a big brother and I have my uh, father and my stepmother in Alabama. And earlier this year at the 810s, I lost, I wouldn't say we lost the role, he killed it, but he went through the effort of having a student's dad do a foreign accent and then read that to himself just to do an accent. So I was like, you know what? I don't want to go too deep and ask my dad or my brother to, because they're actually in the Birmingham. Well, Birmingham and my brother's in Lincoln, the Lincoln area, Alabama. So I just, I just saw the script, started reading, and then I was like, this is really good, really good, and really powerful. I haven't had something like that since um, I was a wrongfully convicted convict earlier this year, and it just. I haven't, it, it was very, very, very down my road of uh, the meat and potatoes of something bigger than just the character, like brooding wise, like uh, this scene's important. The the fight's important to the character, you know, the the growth, the um, everything about it, something, something loud, something I can be vocal with, you know? And uh, I mean, it's it's great. Kenneth, if you've done, it's, it's beautiful. And, you know, ever since I got into um, acting, I've been, I never realized how much I paid attention to pacing and it's, I mean, it's top notch. It's very, it's great. Yeah, really glad to uh, been able to see it. So thank you again, everybody. Great to meet you all too as well. Thank you for being part of this. I haven't seen any pressure, but anyone has, feel free to jump in. And if not, maybe Maria or Jeremy, you want to talk a little bit about your experience with the show? Um, I just think the, the funny thing for me about this show, I remember I got an email from Yvette being like, we're calling you back for Lily Whitfield, this Southern belle for this thing. And I was like, they know that I like don't wear dresses and like high heels are hard for me. Like it was one of those things where I was like, this is, this would never be something I, that I, I would consider myself cast in. And then I started working on the scenes and I was like, oh man, like, there's, there's this, there's so much underneath the surface of like someone who tries so hard to be a good person, but is not willing or not ready yet to take the risk of actually resolving a problem. Like someone who's never had to do that before. And now they're being presented with kind of con confronting how they see themselves and that they're part of a system and all of these other things. And I remember uh, during, during callbacks working in this scene um the, the scene that we just did tonight and I was like man I really want to I want to be this soft feminine creature but also like find this other great stuff and I was just like oh my gosh Lisa's so cool and we're like having a conversation about this scene and I was like but I'll never be cast because I'm not blonde and I'm like not this lithe creature and everything so um it was it was really fun to work on someone and to find the empathy and and really crack the nut of this person who was like, oh, that would never be me. And I've got nothing in common with that. But then finding those moments, it's part of the magic of the whole thing. Um, but yeah, it was, it was I, I will never forget getting that email and being like, oh, you're never gonna get this. That's gonna be some like pretty blonde lady. She'll, she'll do it and you'll go and you'll have fun watching the play. <laughs> and then it was like, oh, cool. No, I want this. So <laughs> that's my memory of it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, much like Maria, I was also surprised to get cast as Lily. So it was a weird series of events. You pulled off that <laughs> pink dress and those gloves like nobody's business. Thank you. Thank you. I was just I, fishing for the compliments. I really hate the typecasting. I really think we all need to open our minds. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, yeah, no, this, much like Lisa was saying, the, the energy in the room was just really something special. Um, it was one of those shows, and I've, I've been lucky enough to be in a few of these now, a few of, a few of which at City Lights, where you kind of do the whole run of the play from, from the first audition or the first read through all the way to the last performance. And I remember we, we finished the last show and we were having the party on stage. And I think I, I, think I might've looked at Steve and I was like, we can't be done like that. That flew by, we can't be done yet, right? Like it just didn't feel like any, like in the best possible way, it didn't feel like we had like worked. Like we had, and we put the work in the script and everything, but like we all just wanted to be there and we're enjoying the work we were doing that uh, it didn't, uh, you know, it wasn't something we wanted to walk away from yet when it ended. And uh, yeah, it was, I remember when we were doing it and we were sitting in the rehearsal room, we kept saying like, wow, I can't believe we're doing this now. It couldn't be more relevant. Then a couple of years passed. So yeah, um, I think, and, and I think looking back on it now, one of the things that, that I really appreciate, uh, like personally taking away was that these issues, you know, whether we wanted to talk about them or not, were always relevant. Uh, back then, now, when we did the show. Um, and it's just a reminder that, um, one, these issues have been around for that long, but two, so have good people uh, who will fight against the bad and who will do their parts to try to make the world a better place. And I think uh, Emily is a really good kind of shining example of that. And in revisiting the play, especially in a time like right now where things are a little more crazy, um, seeing that, you know, people even back then can still stand up and fight for something worth fighting for is really inspiring and revisiting, like just, I, I went, I read it in the bedroom, like a, a couple weeks ago, just on my own. And I got emotional, just like reading the text again. And it's, it's, it's just a really beautiful piece of writing. And it's, it's really wonderful to revisit and to revisit now, right now, especially it's, it's a real treat. So thank you, uh, Lisa and Kenneth and everyone. This is, it's, it's beautiful to come back to you and, and yeah. Thanks for making me emotional and, and cry on camera, y'all. <laughs> you know, Jeremy, do you remember how much we thought how relevant it was and how important it was to tell the story at that time? Oh, and absolutely. that it's like a hundred percent more right now. Yeah. Like, I remember thinking we have to tell this story right now and it is a hundred percent more important today than it was when we decided to do this. And uh, that what that tells me is we should always trust our instinct about stories that we feel are important to tell in the moment that we feel that they are important to tell. Because it's so important right now that I feel like in a way <clears throat> we were ahead of, uh, ahead of knowing that this was something we needed to talk about. And Ken was, Kenneth was, ahead of knowing that it was something we need to talk about. And now, and now it's like, I mean, oh my gosh, like it's, it's beyond that. It's like the, the, there are no words for it's important to tell these stories now. And the only other thing I want to say to you, Jeremy, except that I so miss you. I miss you too. It's good to see you. It's good to see everybody. Hi. Seriously. I so, I so miss you. Why don't you ever answer my text messages? Anyway, um, the only other thing <laughs> that I want to say is I've been in this business for over 30 years because I'm old, unlike you. And I do want to, I do want to tell you this, that will, that should be um, a source of, of comfort and um, it should, it should be um, something that makes you feel fuller. And that is that uh, experiences like this one, when they end, feel so sad. But the truth is, I know because I'm old and I've been doing this for a long time that these special plays stay with us forever and inform the way that we are after. They, they inform our everyday lives after. And so this play is still going on in all of our hearts and souls. And that is the one thing that I, I learned, I don't know, may, maybe five or 10 years ago that I didn't really understand that has really, um, has really given me so much comfort that even though there's a closing night, there really isn't because not only does, it, does that play that Kenneth Jones wrote and that we 
put together together um, is still in us, but it's in all of the people that saw it too. That's the power of what we do is that it's in everyone's hearts and souls for so much for forever, like so much more. It's so much beyond that moment. And um, <clears throat> I didn't realize that for a super long time. So you might not feel that yet, Jeremy, because you're still super young. Uh, but but it it's so true that that's why we do this because it changes people. Absolutely, yeah, and and I think that's something something that I I look back on now and shows like this one and and like so many others I've been lucky enough to be in have, have kind of left on me. It's they they kind of become benchmarks in my memory of like oh yeah that's when like I kind of learned that that's when this thing happens. And I think, you know, every piece of art you make changes you in such a way, but there's certain ones that, you know, when you look back, stands out a great deal. And this is definitely one of those for me. So absolutely, yeah. And now it gets quiet and everyone looks expectantly at me. <laughs> Steve, did you want to talk about your experience? You talked a little bit at the beginning. Did you have anything else you want to say? Um. Yeah, I, I really uh, liked the uh, the whole concept of sort of being the narrator and uh, the stage manager and being able to play those different roles. Um, there was that opening monologue in act two that I had no idea what was going to happen with that um, until opening night and if I remember correctly, I, I got applause after that monologue almost every night and people laughed and it was one of the, the best treats I ever had, Ken, as an actor to get up there and have to spend two long monologues in front of an audience and, and, and not know what the hell was going to happen because it could have fallen flat on its face. Um, but I love doing the different roles. I love doing the one about the three little pigs. Um, and it was just fun to hang on the periphery and watch what was going on and occasionally look at the audience. Like, are you paying attention? Do you know, do you understand what's going on here? Um, and hopefully they did. And uh, I, I just, that was, that was fun. It was a different type of task for me as an actor. Not that I've played multiple roles before, but not one like that. Um, so it was a, it was a lot of fun to put on different hats and do different things. And uh, but like I said, the biggest surprise to me was that opening monologue in Act Two. That was amazing. Tell us, tell us what that monologue was about for those of us who didn't see. There are some people who haven't seen the show. Steve, do you remember the day that we were both like, hmm? Maybe you should be out there more often, even if you don't have lines. Do you remember that day? I do, and I and, and I love the idea, you know, because yeah. I wanted to be able to do more. I my my fear was pulling focus from what was going on on stage, but I figured I could do it if if we did it from the beginning, then people would get used to the fact that I was right. going to do that. Um, well. Plus you gave the focus where it needed to be. You only, you know, you, you gave the focus where it needed to be. You, you were an excellent listener, which we know is like 90% of being a good actor is being a good listener. And then you only, you only connected with the audience in moments that we crafted together. But I, I remember that was something that you, you were into too. Like I, it could have been actually your idea, like not mine. We were like, can I, maybe I should. And I was like, yeah, good. <laughs> but I, I thought that really, you were like sort of the, the glue, you know, to put it together. And also Maria, I didn't want some ditzy ingenue. Like <laughs> I knew from the moment, like I knew I wanted, I wanted some, some uh, substance. I wanted some, you're so beautiful, but I didn't want the traditional. I wanted beauty with also guts and intelligence and, you know, courage and all of those other things that actually, to me, make so so much more of a deeper ingenue. 
Yeah, I think Maria subverted the stereotype in a exactly. great way. We love that. And, and just to pick on, up on what Rebecca was saying, that act two monologue is uh, Garth Williams, the illustrator, coming out and saying, this is why I wrote the book. I didn't do it for a political reason. And Steve did it so beautifully because it was very intimate between him and the audience, but it was also part press conference and part cocktail party and part a stand-up comedy, right? Um, it, is, it, it is written to be funny and delicious, but Steve did it with great elegance and panache. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, I used to call it. I used to call it Steve's tight five at the comedy store. Like he would walk out. <laughs> I was like, "All right, Steve's the warm up. We're doing it. We got it. All right." <laughs> we're going with act two. I remember one night I came out at the opening act two. I just stood there for a minute and looked at the audience like, "Oh boy," and they just started laughing. I hadn't said a word. <laughs> And you've got such a great voice, Steve. I love your voice. Oh, well, thank you. You're very kind. Perfect for this role. I had forgotten about that monologue. Yeah, that, that he comes out as Garth Williams to explain why he wrote the book. Beautiful. I, I well, I think we all have several copies of The Rabbit's Wedding, but uh, yeah, I, I read it to my kids. And it's, it's, you can't even imagine nowadays that it can be controversial. It's a black yeah. rabbit marries a white rabbit and they live happily ever after. And it's so beautiful and it's so sweet and the illustrations are just gorgeous. Unfathomable that that book could cause any kind of problem. And it's still available, still in print on amazon.com yep. yep. or any of your finer independent bookstores or indie book uh, <laughs> stores online, right? I wanted to mention too that um, I can't remember how many of the cast, but uh, several people, we had a really lovely partnership with the San Jose Public Library System. Mm -hmm. And several of you, we went to the library and you had a story time and you read Alabama Story, the book, the kids, or Alabama Story, the, the Rabbit's Wedding. And it was just, it was wonderful. That was a really special moment, I thought. Yeah, that was fun. I think that was, that was Karen and Eric and I, and I think Lisa also did one. I could be remembering this correctly, incorrectly. Uh, but that was a blast because we actually got to read that story to kids and see kids wow. respond to it. Um, and it's one of those things where it's such a cute, sweet book. And we've talked so much about it and like the effects and, and the response to it. They're just going and reading a book for kids. You forget kind of the simple elegance of it and the effect it can have on them. And, you know, the joy that, you know, a, a good children's book can have on kids. It was a really heartwarming, fun evening. I still think about that. It was really nice. Yeah, the library it was wonderful partnering with the library. We donated some of our proceeds and, and they helped promote the show and it was, it was just perfect. Does anyone else have any questions for our cast or our playwright? There's a little bit of chatter in the chat, but uh, not seeing any questions. I, I have one. Um, <clears throat> Ken, if I was interested, um, I don't, maybe, maybe you touched on it earlier, maybe I missed it. I was wondering what gave you the, um, the idea to have um, so many characters, like you know, be stagehand, not the narrator. Was there something in the past, or did that just kind of come to you for for the flow of the play? Do you mean in terms of the form of the play, the the elements of the, the theatrical elements of it? Um, I meant in. Let's see. Um, what I'm trying to say, in retrospect to um, uh, Garth Williams' character. Yeah, I wanted I wanted to save on on the production costs. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I wanted to keep my cast limited to six people, and and you know, Garth plays five people, passers by, maybe six. Um, I just wanted to make it hyper theatrical, really, uh, but I also wanted to make it economically feasible to be produced. There have been a couple of productions, a college productions, where there's a photographer character, there's a passerby character, there's the uh, racist newspaper column, you know, they break those out. And so it does become a cast of 10 or 12. So, um, right. and I'm excited to say that there's been a high school production that has had 22 kids in it, oh, including wow. two kids who play the Senator and, and Lily, uh, sorry, and Emily, who all got scholarships based on their productions. So it's really cool that kids are doing it. Kids are learning. We expanded the parts. There was an ensemble. 
there was an ensemble of protesters talking about race. There was, you know, it's just, we blew it up. And so there's sort of a junior version of it now, but I wanted to make it really hyper theatrical and really give um, an anchor to the play by making Garth Williams a central unifying yeah. force. It's great, it's great. Thank you, thank you. It's fascinating, that's great to hear about that. Anyone else have anything else they'd like to add? We can go on a little bit longer. We can yeah, I just wanna say that uh, Lisa's not as old as she thinks. You wanna talk about old, <laughs> talk to me. Okay. <laughs> I guess you all be, all right? All right. It's delightful to be able to do this again. I love you all. And I hope to see you again in person sometime. Oh, we've got a question that just popped up in the chat um, from the Fennerty family. Is it common that a play with this many productions hasn't been published? Oh, it's an interesting question. Ken? Um, I, I think there's a lot of plays that get a lot of productions that aren't necessarily published. We just don't know that they're published. The rights are handled through me. So I, I negotiate every contract. Usually a publisher does that. I've certainly pitched it to publishers. Um, Samuel French passed, Drama's Play Service passed. Um, I got an offer from a couple of smaller publishers and thought, do I wanna give 15% of this away to, to a company that I may not necessarily get the mileage from? And um, I, I used to be a journalist and a theater journalist, so I'm a really good marketer of my own work. So I've been pitching it around the country and I now get phone calls just over the transom saying, we heard about this play, we did a search for this play. My friend in Cape Cod did this play and we love this play, uh, college did it. So it's all word of mouth. It is, um, uh, you know, although there's been 40 productions of it, it there's also, I have friends who have had 90 productions and they've not been published. So it, it, it really depends. Um, I'm, I, I've always said that I don't need this play to be on Broadway. I want it to be done in every city in the country. And I'm super excited that it's really spread in a grassroots handcrafted kind of way. Listen, I'd love the Broadway money and that would, that would create more productions, right? But um, it's been to, to be able to go to resident theater communities at, at not-for-profits that are committed to this play and committed to telling stories that you don't usually hear. It's not all about just doing the Broadway thing. That's one of my great passions as a theater artist. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, I have to say, this was like a cold call that like made magic. I get a bazillion emails from playwrights all over the country on, on a weekly, if not daily basis. And what I first look at is the blurb. And I was like, oh, because of the um, very strong social justice part of my heart, um, I immediately was taken by the three sentence description. And um, I, I'm grateful that Kenneth sent me that email, but I'm sure it was one of like a hundred to a bunch of different theater companies. And I, read that three sentence and I was like, oh, I think I wanna read this play. But it is it is the thing that hardly ever happens, happened with us, where it came straight to the artistic director. I took the time to read it and then I sent it to the rest of the staff saying, I really like this play. And, um, uh, and, and then, you know, the rest is history, but it, it basically was like a cold call. Totally was, and I, I've had really good luck doing that. I I, so I, tend, I don't write to the gatekeepers. I write right to the artistic director because she'll bump it down if she has to, right, right. Um, to other people. Uh, but I've been so lucky. And, and in fact, I did a cold call to Florida Studio Theater, which did the Florida premiere, and and they're now commissioned, they've commissioned me to write a new play. So it's all about these little relationships. And I'll send you that play, Lisa. Yeah, please do. Seriously, yeah. bring it. Kenneth, this is the perfect time to bring it for planning when there's a vaccine. Um, Ren has such a great question about what were those three sentences. And I can't, uh, obviously can't remember, but it had to do with Emily and it had to do with, um, you know, the heart and the soul of the story. But Kenneth, do you know what those, like what your tagline was? Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I happen to, here's a printout of the thing I put on my social media. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, 
It, it's 1959 and the civil rights movement is starting to grip America. In Montgomery, Alabama, a fight over a controversial children's book, one in which a black rabbit marries a white rabbit, pits a librarian, uh, blah, 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 pits a librarian uh, against a, a, a oops, sorry, uh, pits librarian Emily Willack Reed against segregationist uh, Senator E.W. Higgins. Uh, childhood friends unite only to be caught up in the political and racial tensions of the time. Inspired by true events, this drama explores tests of character and emotions that reshaped our nation. I think that's actually your marketing work copy, but it's very similar to what I, I sent. And I was done. I was done. Like, Ren, I read that and I was like, oh, 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 I'm done. Like, we need to tell this story. And then I read the play and it was fantastic. What a testament to Ken's writing that, that you know, he hooked you in, in four sentences and you're like, yeah, okay, cool. Like, immediately. Like, that's, yep. I love that. That's so cool. So cool. There was, I had one really, I don't know if I told you this, Ken, because I, I think you may have already had left, but, um, you know, we do the talkbacks after each show. The audience comes down and we mingle and we pour wine and water and all that. <laughs> Just like in church, no. But, um this woman comes up to me, this elderly woman, probably in her late 70s. And I said, would you like some wine? She goes, no. And I set the wine bottle down and she grabbed my hand and she gripped it. And she looked me square in the face and says, you know, I was a young black 18 year old girl in Montgomery, Alabama when this was happening. And I really did not like you. <laughs> but she, she said how this play, cause it's a very presentational play. And it's wonderful that way. It works really well as a theater, you know, as a theater piece. But it evokes this experience that was authentic, especially for this for this seventy eight year old woman who said, you know, sixty plus years later, it brought her back there, you know, which I think is really profound when you can touch into a piece of history like that. Probably. I remember you telling that story, Eric. Yeah, that was profound. Well, I think we are going to need to wrap up pretty soon. Um, any other questions, anything else some, anybody wants to add as we finish up here? This has been so great. And thank you again, Ken, for giving us permission to bring parts of your beautiful play to our audience and revisit it. It's been wonderful to see you. Thank you so much for having me. It means I'm just so thrilled to be back and see these faces again. And, and when we're all back after COVID, you know, I would love to work with you all again, and and to, and we've all you know in, uh, kept in touch on social media, and um, it's great to you know gather a band of you know new friends. It's a very lonely experience being a playwright, and to get to meet you was a real gift. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for being here. This was really lovely. Yeah. And uh, as I said earlier, we will have the event recorded, and so. You and <laughs> we will have this recorded and it'll be on YouTube early next week. So you can watch it again and again. And we will be back here in the next stage one more time before holiday break next Sunday at seven. I my guest is going to be San Francisco Chronicle theater critic Lily Janik, and she's going to talk about theater journalism and what it's been like in this crazy year. And and Ken will understand having been a former theater journalist yourself. So looking forward to that. After that, we'll break for a few weeks for the holidays. Thank you again. This was lovely, everyone. Have a great rest of the weekend and stay safe. Take Thanks, Peggy, for all you do. Thank you all. Happy holidays. Thank you.